Um, so welcome to Clonmacnoise, whether um, it's good morning or good afternoon, greetings. So here we are, this is a very famous um, 6th century monastic um, settlement from the um, uh, banks of the Shannon. Now I'm sitting on a boat on the Shannon, so you may get a little bit of pitching and tossing. You wouldn't get this view except from the boat. We've been finding the boat is fantastic for exploring the region and it's, it's a bit like um, when you're out uh, on the main the best view is from the middle of the road well it seems the best views is from the harbour entrances and places like that but we've actually got a nice tidy mooring here with an absolutely gorgeous view and the rain has cleared off so we're going to paint this now um, whilst we just wait for a few more people to join, I'll give you a little bit of history um, here. So this um, settlement was founded by St. Kieran in 544 and um, he, had he had trained under um, St. Finian uh, with um, a 12 very well-known uh, monks who went off and spread the, the Gospels. One was St. Columba who founded the amazingly peaceful um, Iona um, uh, Monastery and um, also the um, Duro Monastery. So when he was um, uh, founding the Duro one, he came to visit here and, um, and it's said that um, he, he told everybody that, the, that angels had visited here as well, but certainly it's a very peaceful, um, special, special site. It's also said that one of the young monks um, of the time um, decided that he would touch the um, cloak of the very famous um, um, uh, Columba and, um, and he tried to do so without being noticed but uh, Columba felt it. So he, um, he turned around and he grabbed the youngster by, um, by his neck <laughs> and uh, told him to open his mouth and he blessed him and told him that he would um, spread the scriptures and he went on to be again very famous. So we're going to start by drawing this in. So what we're going to do is, uh, this is acrylic paint. Don't be afraid of your acrylic paint. It, uh, I know um, being on, on the water with the wind and the sun, if it comes out, is actually about the most challenging thing you can do with the paint because um, they, they both have a drying effect on it. But if you use this substance, which is called acrylic medium, and it comes in a bottle that says, Artists acrylic medium. I'm using the gloss version. You can get a matte version as well, but I like the gloss best. Uh, and you mix it with the paint. You see it looks white when it comes out of the tube, but it, it dries transparent. So um, I'm, I'm using a little bit of water for the drawing in. What the water does is it thins it. So if you use only water with your acrylics, as some people do, what you're doing is you're thinning it all the time and that will compound your problem of it drying because obviously when you thin the paint, it's a plastic and it reacts with the air and it, it, it dries. So the first thing I'm doing is establishing where um, the land is and where um, the, uh, the water is. So what I want to do is each line, preferably every single line I put on this picture, every single shape I put on this picture, should improve the composition, should make the whole thing more interesting. So I want to make sure that this initial shape here is a different size to this initial shape up there. So it's a different area. See, if I, if I were to draw a line right dead, dead, dead smack in the center there, that's just, um, I'm just doing that to show you. It doesn't feel as nice, does it? See, oh, that's a bit above, but if it was right on, on the center, uh, you see, it would be just boring. It doesn't feel as good as this one here. So if we put all of this in as water, this is going to be um, something that's pleasing to the eye. You want to make something that feels good. Now, how do you get the shore coming towards you? Well, very simple. You start with your horizontal line and then you just put a little curve or a little triangle on it, you see? And that just gives us the feeling of this shore as it sweeps around to us. And then I can put some nice little stones and, and rocks and, and bits of detail in there later. But to begin with, I'm going to put in the big shapes. So um, uh, there's the pier coming out there. Oh, we've got a schmear of rain coming, but uh, it's only a schmear. Okay, now the next thing to do is to establish the uh, land that the uh, buildings are sitting on. And it, do you see, if you look at that, that's a triangle. So we've got two rectangles at the moment, and now we want a triangle. 
and um, the folks that are monitoring this can let me know if my paint isn't quite strong enough for you to see. So maybe I'll make it a little stronger just in case. Um, so now, all, all of that land together, if you look at it as one shape, makes a triangle. And again, I'm just putting this line on so that it makes a pleasing division. That's all my intention is. All I want to do is to get a nice, pleasing division. So this triangle now is um, smaller than that triangle. Then the next thing I would do is to start positioning, very simply, the main features of the, of the uh, landscape. So that, that big tower is going to be the bounding edge of my uh, landscape. So let's just put it in, just as a tower. OK. Now, I'm going to do this as a guesstimate, just a, an estimate that's a guess, uh, by eye first. And after I've done the, the guesstimate, then I'll show you how to measure to check if you're right or not. Now, as we came into our mooring, um, uh, we were a little bit further forward, and I could see, well, that's rather nice, having the um, bird coming in there. But, um, it was rather nice to see a little bit more of the tower, but we had to move the boat boat back a bit so I'm just painting here from memory how it was when I I was where that black pole is and um, and you could see some of the tower so I'm just marking in the trees that I could see uh, that, uh, then so basically what this is is a, is a curve so it's, it's like a part of a circle so um, in the school we're the Irish School of Landscape Painting and you'll find us at um, isolp.com so in the school, um, through the winter, we study the work of many different artists. And the reason we do that is so that when we go out into the landscape, we have um, all the wealth of knowledge that history gives us. So that um, uh, we, in the winter, uh, we, we study it um, in theory, but we also um, do in practice. So normally what I would do in the class is um, we, we, we focus on a particular artist and um, I do a demonstration in the style of that artist and um, much as I'm going to tell you a bit of, about the history here and, um, and, and paint in the style of that artist. So w what we discovered from these studies is that Cezanne, um, who uh, was really the um, biggest influence on modern design, he um, said that all natural shape can be reduced to the um, sphere, uh, the cone, and the cylinder. Well, in, in easier terms for us nowadays, um, what we in the school say, because it's just easier to um, uh, apply, is the circle, the rectangle, and the triangle. So you can imagine if you have a conical shape, if you slice that in two, you see a triangle. If you have a cylinder, like a tube of Pringles or um, like this, like like this, if you um, slice that in two, what you're going to see flat on is a rectangle. And you, if you have a, a variety of these shapes in your picture, that's going to give you a good composition. So that's um, that's what I'm looking at as I uh, come here to draw this. Uh, so instead of thinking, oh, this is Clonmic Noise, this is um, uh, you know, a very famous tower and, and, and this is um, that temple and, and, and getting worried about what it is that I'm painting, all I have to do is think, well, is it a rectangle? Is it a triangle? Is it a circle? And just put it in simply as that. Now, I'm not going to try to get too much detail as I'm uh, working today because I can use a photograph for that. But what I can't use the photograph for is to get the feeling of sitting here on the boat in the sunshine, which is just coming, and, um, uh, and being a part of this view, having the feeling of this view. So that's the important thing to capture while you're on site. Now, I, I'm working now into these uh, uh, trees in uh, the, the almost foreground field, the middle ground field. Um, because I'm sitting here looking at the view, I can see more of that field than I would see where I, in a, using a photograph, which would flatten the perspective of the, of the, of the background. It's very useful also being on this uh, top deck. I'm sitting on the roof of the cabin beneath. 
um, to get a better angle on the, on the uh, scene. So there's, uh, there's the, the, the big uh, arrangement of, of, of a bush, and here's a little bush, which is a little triangle, and then I think we'll mark in the, the cattle, which will be rather nice to have too. In fact, when we first came, they were down here. There were a few lying down here by the water, which, which was very attractive. Now, having put in the main objects of the composition there very simply and purely by guesstimate, um, oh, the waves are rather nice coming in here. So I'm just going to mark that in. I guess one of the boats just moved. There are lots of uh, hired cruisers around us. So there'll be plenty of movement. Now, you don't want the paint to dry on your brush while you're doing something else, so I'm putting that in there to um, stay dry. Now, I could, I could measure this with a ruler, but sure, I've got a brush here, why not use that? So what I'm doing is I'm placing the top of the brush against that line and moving this finger to um, uh, find the measurement. And then I just keep it there, and then I know it doesn't matter whether it's 11 inches, 10 inches, or six inches. What does it matter? All it matters is, is that this is a measurement. This is measurement A. Didn't think you were gonna do maths, did you, today? So <laughs> there's measurement A, and I wanna make sure that that is a different measurement to measurement B, which is the height of the um, uh, sky there, okay? And over here, um, again, the sky, uh, I want to make sure that that's different to all my other measurements. Now look, that is exactly the same as the amount of land beneath it. Now, if I want to make this a little bit more interesting, it would be good to refine that. It would be good if I can have my measurements all different. So let's try for that. So I'm going to um, uh, use a different colour. This is purple now with a bit of medium on it. And I'm just pulling that down just a little bit to here, maybe a little bit more. The boat is rocking me a bit. Okay, now let's check the measurement now. That measurement is now different to that measurement. Doesn't matter that it's scruffy, Nobody sees the underneath um, drawing. Now, in the same way, I'm going to check that the gaps between my buildings are all different. So there's the first gap between the tower and the uh, big church. There's gap one. And then we have the gap between that and the next church, which is different and, again, different. So that's good. If they were equal, then I'd move the church or the um, uh, oratory or uh, whatever needed moving. Now, the next thing to do, this is the, the tricky bit um, for measuring, often people um, um, have difficulty with. Now, the length of my arm is not likely to change in the next half hour. And the move, the, the, where I'm sitting on the seat is also not like to, likely to change if I'm careful. So if I rest my back against the back of my seat, okay, and I extend my arm full length, that should stay a steady measurement. Now, what I'm going to do is close one eye, and line up the top of the tower with the top of my brush. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're having difficulty understanding this, do this with a pencil, a pen, anything you have around, and measure an object in your room. And what you're going to do is put, compare the size of that to another object. So if you have two cups of tea in front of you, and one is further away from you than the next, you're going to measure the, the height of one and see if it's the same as the other one or different. And if it's different, is it bigger or smaller? That's all you're doing. So I'm going to visually, for myself, line this up with the top of the tar, slide my finger until it's at the bottom of the tar. Okay, I'm going to do that now. So that's the measurement that, that I see to the bottom of the trees. Now, if I were to take it and place it on my canvas, that makes no sense uh, at all because what I see doesn't necessarily be the same that I'm drawing it in on the canvas. What I need to know is, is this tower bigger or smaller than that tower? And if so, how much? So I, I've got my measurement. Now I'm going to rotate my hand and arm 90 degrees. And I see that that measurement um, goes right, ne right up to the bush beside the next building, okay? And if I go to that bush, if I go to that bush, 
Um, then it goes to the other side of the, that building, to the long rectangle bit, and then to the tree on the other side of the small building. OK, so let's try that. So to the bottom of the trees. So now I take the measurement that's on my canvas, because what's important is, is this bigger or smaller than this gap? OK, so now I do that, rotate it 90 degrees, and then see if this lines up the way that my uh, it does visually in front of me. And it does, um, actually, uh, pretty much. If it didn't, I would change it, but um, it actually does. So now I've got all of those more or less right. I'll just crisp them up the drawing. So if you want to know, um, if you want to know how, how wide the tower should be in relation to its height, you do the same thing. I'm now measuring the width of it. And I'm looking, how many times does that go into the actual height of the tower? It goes five times. So this width here wants to go five times into its height. One, two, three, four, five to the bottom of the trees. That's fine. So I wasn't, wasn't that lucky. If I wasn't lucky, then I would just change it. Now, if I, if I put some um, um, darker paint on that, even when I paint the sky in, I will be able to see those lines. Um, and so I don't need to, 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 to worry about losing them. Now, there's a rather nice effect in the field here. Do you see where the there's a little hillock there. So these are the smaller shapes you can now get in. So I started by putting in my big shapes and then I put in my smaller shapes. Now the actual um, tree trunks are rather nice. They make a very nice pattern through there. Silhouetted pattern. Yes, I know those are too thick. What I'm, what I'm making is too thick, but I'm going to be painting the sky over that in a moment anyway. What I'm doing is I'm marking it in and by the physical act of marking it in, it kind of puts it into your head and you'll find it much easier to draw it later on if you've, if you've done this on site. Now, let's go across to the um, smaller building. Now, I, the other thing I need to check with my smaller building is, is it in the middle of the picture? Now, that would not be good if it came right in the middle of the picture. So I take measurement A and see if it's the same as measurement B. It's slightly different. I might just exaggerate the difference and bring it slightly over. Now, the other thing I need to do is to find out, is it the right height? So what I do is I take a horizontal line and I, I, I make the horizontal line across from the pinnacle of the uh, church across to the um, tower to see um, if it bisects in the right place. And it bisects just across the top of these trees, so that works. And then the same um, for this other tower. So this other tower I have a bit short, so it comes up a bit more, which actually makes a more interesting picture for me. So I'm very happy for that. So it comes up to about here. So this business of painting, it really doesn't need to be complicated. So we're a landscape school and we use a four-stage method. And it's a very simple four-stage method. And we've been studying lots of different artists um, over the last year because we took to live streaming since the uh, COVID pandemic. And, um, and we have covered, oh, Cezanne, Monet, um, Pizarro, Gauguin, um, uh, Turner, Renoir, uh, Vlaminck, uh, who else, um, Matisse, lots of different people. So what we do is we look at how they work and you know what, uh, we, the way they work also breaks down into the, this four-stage method. So what the four-stage method is, is it's not, it's not about a particular technique. Um, because each of those artists have their own different techniques. We, we've covered post-impressionism, impressionism, expressionism, Van Gogh, um, all kinds of different artists. Turner um, from a century before. Um, and what happens is, it, by using this four-stage method, it just, it just simplifies the thinking for you. So that instead of being afraid when you come to paint, instead of being worried or caught up 
in am I getting it right? You can just simply do the four stages and by golly, it will work for you. You'll, you'll get, even, even if your hand is less practiced than mine, um, you'll get something that will look like the scene. Um, and, uh, and it's really fun studying what other people are because the, you know, there's always a relevance, there's always something that you t can take from it yourself. Um, and uh, it, it's just a fun thing to do. Anyway, let's get back to Clon McNoise. So um, um, St. Kieran was um, very wise to come here because uh, here we are um, on the main, well, just imagine coming up here in the, um, in the ninth century monastery with 2,000 people, um, 2,000 monks in there and, and a whole settlement. Uh, it would have been quite, quite spectacular. And Kieran could see the possibility for this because we're on a, um, a roadway which ran along an esker. So it was made by the receding um, um, ice on the Ice Age and it left behind a ridge of, of shaley stone. Uh, which, of course, in later years, then became a very convenient way to traverse over Irish bogland and, um, and, and just made a natural roadway. So it was both on the main uh, north scythe route, which was the river, the River Shannon, the, 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 this huge, huge river, and it was also on the main east-west um, roadway. So it was uh, a crossing point. And... Um, um, and what a, what a wonderful place to spread the word. So he came here and uh, Dermot, um, who later became, um, when he was 33, only a few years later, pretty young, he became High King, the first High King um, uh, of Tara. And he helped um, Kieran to build the first church here, which was very small. If you go look at it, it's really small. Um, and it would have been made out of wood in those days. Um, but unfortunately, Kieran um, didn't get to stay here for very long because he died um, not that long afterwards from the plague. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the less advantageous things of living in a settlement in those days. Um, now, I'm going to start, that's my first stage done. So this is stage one that we use, which is to select and draw in your composition. So whether it's an academic picture, um, or an abstract picture or a, a expressionist picture, whatever it is, you, you, the very first stage is always to select and, and draw in your composition. If it's a, uh, an abstract, then you would say draw in the design because you'd be looking at it in a more two-dimensional way. Um, but if it's, a, if it's a composition and you're thinking three dimensions, um, anyway, the first thing is to select and draw it in and to decide what style you're going to paint this in. Um, are you going to paint it um, in one of those ways? And indeed, what materials are you going to use? Are you going to use acrylics? Are you going to use oils? Are you going to use brushwork? Are you going to use palette knife? So you decide where you're going. So you get into your um, uh, car and you set your GPS. It helps to know which way you're going. So I've decided to do this in an academic uh, um, way, just a, a simple, straightforward, realistic picture. So I've mixed up my first colour. And because this is pretty grey and rainy, it's misly rain coming in again, I'm going to paint it how it's going to be, I think, tonight when the sun goes down. So I'm making this much warmer and I'm using um, yellow ochre and cadmium orange in with, um, in with the uh, yellow ochre. And you see, as I brush that um, quite loosely, oh, by, by, by the way, these marks are just from traveling in the boat. It's just a, a you know, um, uh, bits of stuff from the boat that, that got onto the canvas. Doesn't bother me because the paint should go over it. So I used the acrylic medium, I used the white, I used the yellow ochre, I used the cadmium orange, and I um, pummeled them together with a knife. So um, the secret of getting nice creamy paint that does what you want it to do, whoa, there's the wake from a boat, passing boat. Um, the secret is to um, 
uh, uh, make it creamy is to, is to mix it really well. So I'm just taking a big brush and I'm just ladling it on there. Now my canvas has quite a big tooth to it. Um, uh, it. It just happens to be the type of canvas that it is. And what that does is it, um, it, it means that it absorbs more paint. So I'm using a fair amount of paint. But you see, when you use a fair amount of paint, it gives it a certain body, a certain heft, a certain um, substance to it. So it's not thick as in lumpy, it's uh, creamy, but there's a fair amount of paint there which covers over these black grease marks. And Now, um, I, I already got a little bit of purple into that from my underneath um, drawing. I'm going to add a little bit more purple and a little bit of blue. Um, for the um, underneath parts of the cloud. You see how, how dense that is? So when rain clouds are um, formed, the heavier particles of water go to the base. So you know you're in for rain when you get lots of these darker clouds with their bases looking very heavily laden. Um, don't worry if it does rain, I'll, I can continue because um, all the important equipment is inside in the boat cabin. Another really convenient thing about the boat. So the reason I'm starting with the sky is because that sets the tone for the entire picture. Not only that, it's the biggest area on the canvas. So really, I want the biggest area of the canvas to be um, painted first so that I can make the smaller shapes work with the bigger shapes instead of the other way around. So I wouldn't start with the detail. I would always start with the, um, uh, the main shapes. So that's going to give us a little bit of an evening glow. Now the next is to put in the blue. So um, it will take a little bit of ultramarine. And here I am trying to mix it with my brush because it's so tempting to do that. But you know what? You'll never get the same creamy effect with the brush that you do mixing it with a knife. Because you see how I can squish that in and you'll find that your paint will vary from tube to tube. Some tubes will have slightly older paint. So for instance, um, this one here, you can see is quite gummy and that's an older cobalt blue deep. And this is a fresh cobalt blue. And, um, and the one that's older is um, gummy. Not as nice to work with. You have to re-mush the medium back in with the, in with the paint. Now, if I had monestial blue or thalo blue, which I don't have right now, um, I would use that. But since I don't have it, I do have this cobalt um, turquoise, which you can see is a cold greeny colour. Now, what is cold colour? What is warm colour? Warm colour has the effect of feeling like it comes towards you. Cold feels like it goes away. So you see, these are warm colours, yellows, oranges, reds. They feel like they come towards you. And these are the colder colours, blues and purples, and they feel like they go away from you. So what we're trying to do with this picture is to give an effect of sitting here and seeing the landscape before our eyes. So we're trying to give a three-dimensional effect, an optical illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface, which is the canvas. So if I use colour as my ally, to do that, it will make it a whole lot easier. So I'm giving uh, a little bit of, of an effect of the rain, because that's what's sitting there in front of me. Uh, now, as we go up to the top of the sky, uh, if we could see any warmth, which we can't at the moment, it would be a warmer blue. So this would be more ultramarine um, or cobalt blue, but a slightly warmer blue. So this is colder, tends to go away at the horizon, and up above is warmer, and it helps it to, to come towards you. 
Now you see how nicely that um, paint blends. If the paint isn't doing that for you, if it's not blending nicely, then what you do is you go back to your palette and remix. Rather than st struggling with it on the canvas, ju just go back to the palette. Now, I think we want a little bit of the, uh, the blue, bluey green in behind the, that's a little bit too strong. Little bit in behind the trees. Now, do you remember I said that I'll remember where the objects are if I um, if I've painted them in once. So I don't mind going over those trees a little bit. There's a bit of light coming um, from back there, so I'm just going to put that in. So also. I need to decide which way my light is coming from. Is it coming from the right or is it coming from the left? Well, I can't see any light at the moment, so I'm just going to have to make an, uh, a decision that, that suits for me. So um, I think I would like the light coming from the left here because it can strike onto the side of this tower and then I can have the darks where the trees are. So that's where I'm going to have my light come from. And once I've made that decision, I don't want to change my mind because if I change my mind, then um, the bits that I've painted in with it um, coming from uh, the left won't be right anymore. Um, so a, a common thing that, 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 that people who aren't used to painting in the landscape do is that they start painting in the morning and they keep painting all day and they feel like they're chasing the, the, the painting around all the time rather than coming to a conclusion because they keep copying what's in front of them. And what's in front of them is, is a sun that moves. So if they start with it on the um, left-hand side, by the afternoon it's moved to the right or behind them, but it's, it's moved and, and then that makes it um, very hard to reach your final conclusion. So the reason we developed this um, four-stage method um, is so that you can <coughs> always find your own way through a picture, that you don't have to be reliant on, um, on someone else coming uh, to give you advice on your picture, that you can um, always know how to, to tackle the next stage. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a nice safety blanket. Um, now I'm putting in a few really dark pieces because that's what's there. Um, so this is a little bit of a colour we call light red. It's, um, it's a very useful colour, it's actually a brown colour, it's like a terracotta and I've mixed that with the ultramarine blue and that gives this very soft grey warm Clyde that's very typical of here. So you want to be careful of your tone, or our American um, friends call it value, which is the degree of light and dark of the colour. So um, you just be aware of that. No. Okay, so I think that's enough just to, to block in that uh, sky. We'll uh, put a little bit through here uh, because it's easier to put it in now while I've got the, the colour um, for looking through the trees. So when I come to block in those trees, I already have a nice, nice bit of blue through there. Now, the next biggest area is plainly the water. Now, what are we going to do with that? Okay, let's um, just get a nice thick bit of paint out. Okay, so I'm going to take some of this um, um, cobalt blue. Again, I should be mixing it, shouldn't I? Let's see if I get away with it, because it'll make me quicker. But probably... Probably, I should be spending the time mixing. <laughs> so 
So I'm just putting that in with a feel of, of which way the water is flowing. It gets a little greeny over there, doesn't it? So let's use some of that green from the sky with a bit more blue. Now, the, the water is always going to be influenced by the sky because obviously it's reflecting the sky to some degree. So you won't get a bright blue water with a dark grey sky. Now, this actually uses quite a lot of paint, but it's quite a big area. So, um, St. Saint, Kieran Saint um, passed away um, quite early on in the life of this um, settlement. <clears throat> and then at the, um, at the 7th, 8th century, there was another big plague that, that carried off um, quite a lot of the teachers and the, the students. But from the 8th to the 12th century, this was a thriving place. At its height, as I said, there were, there were 2,000 uh, men here. But as, as well as the, the, um, the actual settlement of one cathedral, seven churches, three high crosses. Um, did I skip out anything? About 700 are early uh, early Irish um, uh, uh, grave slabs. But, uh, so as well as all of that settlement, there was the, the whole supporting settlement of lay people all around. So it became a, a, a renowned center of learning and um, culture, actually, learning and artistic endeavor, uh, because there was fine metal workers and woodworkers and stonemasons. Uh, the carving on the most famous of the three high crosses um, is, is of um, the scripture and it's, it's um, very refined. Um, there was a, in the church uh, where um, St. Kieran is, 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 is reputedly buried underneath, which is the first one um, which he built, it's called Temple Kieran. And, um, and they, of course, in later years, replaced it with stone. But they, they did some excavations there, and they find this amazing crozier, um, really ornately carved. But they didn't find uh, the remains of the saint, but they say that he, he's buried there. So I'm just using different tones, that's degrees of light and dark, um, uh, with the colors that I mixed for the sky and, um, and, the, and the, the water. And uh, they're all just variations of that blue, green, purple, green, and um, it gives a, a feeling now of the water that we're sitting on. So the actual area that we've got left to work with is, uh, what, a fifth of the canvas? Um, so that really trims down what I have to do. It makes it much more manageable. Now, this piece of land, uh, just to make it really simple, I'm just going to start with a bit of lemon. Of course, it's, mis it's mixing with what's already on, on my brush. So I haven't cleaned the brush. I haven't dipped it in the water because dipping it in the water is going to um, cause it to uh, thin. And if it thins, it's not going to go on creamy like this. Now, you have a live chat function. So if you want to ask me questions at any time, I never mind being interrupted. You can always ask. Um, I can show you details of how I mix this or, or elaborate on any point that you would like. So there were lots of raids on the, um, on the monastery because it became um, known as this um, centre for learning. It became wealthy and it was a good place for those who wanted to loot to come to. So um, 
It was looted at least 27 times by the Irish themselves. It was looted at least um, 27 times by the Irish. It seems an like extraordinary figure. Um, and, uh, and then about um, seven to at least seven times by the Vikings and at least six times by the Normans. Uh, that was just a lump of paint that I'm mushing into the canvas. Because when acrylic dries to a lump, um, it's slightly harder to get off because it's, uh, um, it's this plasticky sort of base, so it resists coming off quite, quite a lot. Okay, I have a bit of a blue streak there. Oh, well, I'll put some paint over it um, shortly. I, I didn't notice that till just now. So, um, 8th century, they um, had um, all these uh, Viking and, and Irish and, and Norman uh, raids. So they um, built stronger and stronger buildings. And um, continued to prosper. I used a little bit of ochre in with this, just to vary the colour there. So I'm looking at the shape now of, of the tall grass. So I'm, I'm going to shortly introduce a bit of um, a light red into that to get the pinky colour. But um, just to begin with, I'm blocking in the basic tone and colour of the main area. So it helps me to see it as a shape rather than seeing it as individual um, uh, reeds and, and tall grasses and all the bits of, of detail that are there. And as I go further back, it's getting a little colder. So I put a little bit of the uh, cobalt turquoise in there. So if you want to do this yourself, and I highly recommend that you do, um, then what you do, because the recording's going to stay up on our website, so that's at um, Irish School of Landscape Painting.com or ISOLP.com. Um, so you can just go to the site and you'll find the recording there. And uh, what you do is you freeze frame the, um, the stream on the palette and take your, your own time and mix up the colour to match what you see on the palette and then on you go to the next bit. So we find this to be a really excellent method of teaching, um, thanks to all the, the lockdowns, because um, my, my technical team here, when they zoom in, they're actually zooming in to larger than life size quite often. So you get to see the real detail of how I use the brush. Um, anyway, the people that have been doing it have made tremendous progress. So, you see it's more lemon here, more cobalt turquoise here, and more um, ochre here. But it's basically the same mix. There isn't a lot of difference in the mix. Now, I think that that is probably a little exaggerated, although I've got bushes coming down to there, so I guess it's all right. I might just put a little bit of that green there in case I decide not to exaggerate it quite so much. Now, that's my big brush done with. Okay, I'm going to clean it off. I see the paint has missed a couple of bits in the, in the water there. Um, I can fill that in later. If I was doing this for myself, I'd take the time to fill it in, but you don't want to be hanging around seeing me um, fiddle with that, so I'll do it after. The main thing is to show you the technique. So what I'm doing now is making sure that I clean that brush quite well in the water. So shovel it up and down. I've got three big containers of water there. And then I squeeze it like this. So from the ferrule, which is this, I squeeze it tight there and pull it back into shape until there is no colour coming off on my uh, tissue. It's kitchen roll. And then I know the brush is clean. Otherwise, what will happen is the paint dries in there at the ferrule and then the hairs will start to splay out like that. You don't have the nice shape to the, to the brush anymore. So I'm going to take a smaller brush. Uh, this is a half inch Daylon brush, and, uh, which is a synthetic brush. It's very useful. And I'm going to now mix the colour for the tower. 
my knife is also sitting in a pot of water so that it, it doesn't um, dry into a lump on the, on the knife. So I'm taking my burnt sienna, touch of black, you could use blue if you want instead, and a little bit of that sky colour so it becomes a grey. You see how useful it is to have this big plate where I can keep adding things in to the, the, the colours that I've just used. Both it means that I don't waste any paint, but also it means that my colours naturally uh, um, meld together. The, it, it helps to give a, a, a colour harmony to the picture. What, some people like to, to use palettes with little divots, little, um, little pools of separate paint. Um, which is fine if that works for you, but uh, I would find that A, fiddly, but B, I wouldn't have the advantage of being able to mush the paint together. Now, when I say mush it together, you see how I'm keeping the individual piles clean. And this is by the systematic use of, the, of, of blocking in um, the big areas and being aware of your warm and your cold colours. Now, I'm not going to worry that I'm getting a little wobble because of the boat, because that I can fix later on when I get back to the studio. So this is uh, the colours I showed you over the purple uh, marking of it. And you see how it gives a little bit of the texture of the stone, which is quite nice. Now, for the next building, I'm going to use a little bit more blue and white, uh, because it happens to be there from the sky. So it's really handy for me to just pick it up on the brush and I'm going to mark in the next um, tower. Well, it's a church. Now, it wants to be a little bit darker than that, so I'm going to take a little bit more of the blue, more of the purple and the, and the black, and make that minor adjustment with the brush. Okay, and then we have a, a, a flat bit <laughs> as the boat rocks me to and fro. So the secret on the boat is to start with a quite heavy stroke. So you're pushing into the canvas. So the canvas itself sort of supports you and then to lift it very lightly um, when the boat starts to flick, flick you out from underneath. But I guess most of you won't be doing this from the boat. So I'm just putting in the wall that runs along. And then the next church, which is a little oratory. So the first of these towers that was built um, in the 12th century, um, they built the tower and then um, 11 years later there was a lightning storm and the whole of the top of it um, um, fell off, which is that, that big one there. And, um, and then they built a smaller one afterwards. So in the 12th, so 8th to 12th century, um, Clomic Noyce was doing very, very nicely. And then in the 12th century, um, the um, Athlone, because I've got a lump of paint I just dropped on the boat there, we just clean that up. Because when acrylic dries hard, it is much harder to get off. And this is a pristine white boat, so we don't want that happening. There we go. So, uh, easily done if you spot it. And if not, alcohol helps. <laughs> I mean, alcohol wipes, <laughs> not, not, not to help you. Um, anyway, 12th century, and the, um, uh, the monastery um, started to um, have a bit more competition because Ath the town of Athlone um, was becoming more and more popular and quite a lot of the um, ancillary um, uh, 
lay people from the settlement around began to move to Athlone. So there's a, there's a little um, gateway here, so I'm marking this in um, a little lighter. If you're having problems with rocking the boat, you can support your finger to do that so that you um, can see where it goes. So um, a, a lot of the, um, the, the, the uh, lay people moved to Athlone because it was a bigger town, it was better defended, and, um, and they, uh, they moved there. So then, uh, because they'd moved, um, the um, patrons, the um, uh, uh, people that had, had supported um, uh, Clomac Noyce saw that it had less influence and uh, that was not an encouragement to them to, for, for them to continue to, to support it. Also, at the same time, we had an influ influx from the continent of the Benedictines and the Franciscans and um, uh, a, a whole lot of, 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 of more religious people coming, um, coming through then. And so, um, and also the, the whole system in Ireland of uh, monasteries uh, became uh, less important as the diocesan um, uh, movement with these new uh, uh, religious orders became dominant. So um, Clomac Noyce became less, uh, less important, less uh, busy. And then the final thing that happened uh, was um, a raid from the um, uh, English, English garrison in Athlone in um, the 16th century, uh, 1526, uh, I think, and, uh, and that destroyed, destroyed Clan McNoise and uh, they looted everything. And it never really, rec it never recovered from that. That was, that was it. But it's been a beautiful ruin uh, ever since. In 1864, there was, um, it was known as the Seven Churches. And um, uh, one of the uh, people who came from Burr um, uh, was prosecuted by the, by the Crown for vandalism. So people still came here, but it was a ruin. Um, and there was a society, a heritage society, Irish Heritage Society, that was already um, looking at um, restoring and preserving uh, what there was. So now I'm using the edge of the brush just to, to pick up bits of light and bits of dark, um, smaller shapes as we go through the composition. Same brush. Now you don't have to use such a big brush if you don't want to. But you know, I'm wanting to do this relatively quickly for you. So uh, now I see that the angle I have on that roof isn't steep enough. So I'm just making that a steeper angled roof. Okay, now we have some, um, uh, while I've got these stones, uh, stone colour on my brush, we have stones on the foreshore here, which I want to block in. There's a whole collection here on, on this shore. So we're still at what we call the blocking in stage. So, so the whole idea of this stage, which is the second stage, is to block in the composition, is to establish each area in its basic tone and color, is to um, provide something like a road map or a blueprint. So when you stand back from this, it's not, it's, it's not to um, have a finished picture, the idea is to have this plan, this map, um, a, an establishment of which areas are light, which areas are dark, um, 
Uh, so when you stand back, each area should sit within its realm. So the, the sea or the, the water, the Shannon should sit in the front. Uh, the middle distance sit the, um, behind it, the distant field behind that. Um, each area where it should be. And if it doesn't, then what you do is you go back and you fix it while it's simple. I wouldn't keep going on and developing and putting more detail into it if you don't have your main shapes sitting where they should be, because it just gets more complicated as you go along. So uh, just simple, simple. Now we have a boat moving. We're going to get a little bit of wake from it. So I will just let that uh, settle. So I'm just cleaning the brush, the smaller brush, same way. Oh, we've been live for an hour, I'm told. So um, that's, a good, that's a good place to stop for our coffee break. We take a 20 minute coffee break and it gives you a chance to make notes, to um, sit and enjoy the basic block in before we go on to putting in the smaller shapes. So we'll do that in 20 minutes after the coffee break. See you then, 20 minutes time, bye.
and welcome back. Okay, hope that was refreshing. Now, we have to put in our smaller shapes, so we have all of these small bushes to put in. So I know they're small shapes, but I'm still going to use a relatively large brush. There's a, a number 10 hog. Maybe I'll take a... out. And... Um, a little the sap green, and I'm going to start with the cold um, 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 ones from over here. So I'm going to use a little bit of the um, cobalt green uh, turquoise just to make it cold. And because I haven't got the olive green, which is a browny green, I'm putting a little bit of burnt sienna with it as well. Because this is quite a big mass over there of, of trees um, next to the, um, the tower. Now, I, my memory of how that was is, is starting to fade, which is extraordinary how quickly that happens. But I do know I want to see some of the tower. So I'm uh, taking the shapes that I see on the, uh, the trees and just shifting them slightly to the right so that I have the, uh, the feel of that um, particular group. Okay, I also remember that my light is coming from the left, so I'm bringing um, a little of uh, the cobalt green with yellow ochre, that we have a feel of the light coming in there. So the, this is um, a fir tree. Um, quite native to Ireland. Pine tree. So I'm, I'm looking at the, and I'm pushing in the brush to emulate the outline of those can, can, uh, canopies. Not worrying for the moment about putting in the um, uh, supporting trunks at the moment. And you see how useful that is now to have the, the little bit of um, blue from behind. Now as we come down, the foliage gets a little warmer. That's a little bit of lemon, but I think we want it warmer still. So I'm taking a little bit of cadmium in with the cobalt green and the uh, sap green. And we're getting in the mass of greenery that the, the, um, the tower emerges from. I don't mind if it overlaps my uh, grass below because I can wipe it off, especially now we've had a 20 minute break. Um, the the uh, underneath paint for the field will be pretty much dry. So I don't have to overdo the amount of, of blue that shows through though, just need a little bit. Now then, in behind the um, a church, we could be a little bit more accurate with the um, foliage. So I'm just putting that brush into a, a glass of water. And I take a smaller brush, take a little bit of the medium because the paint is drying fairly quickly. Now, the first um, uh, lot of trees that I can see there are quite bluish darkish. So I used a little bit of the cobalt blue in with it. And I'm just, just looking for the shape. So that's a triangle. And this is another triangle beside it, but it's slightly fuller, slightly bigger, slightly rounder. 
rounded edges. And then we have quite a rounded bush, which is a little bit more ochery. Now, I don't know how well that comes across with the camera. Um, it certainly wouldn't photograph that accurately. But as you sit here on the site, it does uh, give you a little bit of that feel. Your eyes seem to be able to perceive that more readily than a camera can. Now for the one right next to the church, I'm adding a little bit of orange. And the advantage of each of these um, small adjustments is that it gives you a variety through your greens. And they're all there in nature. You just have to look at the, the bush or the tree and you say to yourself, well, um, is, is the green a bluey green or a yellowy green? And if it's a yellowy green, then is it um, a earthy yellowy green or a bright green? And if it's a bright green, is it a very warm green? Um, or is it um, a coldish yellow light? And then you know which of your yellows to put with it um, to, to make what you want. So it's just a question of being analytical. Okay, so this is a very solid um, uh, piece of foliage. But it has a quite distinctive silhouette. Now next to it is a slightly briner, um, uh, quite roundish tree. with a similarly um, distinct silhouette. Different silhouette, but also quite a distinct one. Now, the one that's right behind that church is that oratory is um, definitely a bit bluer. So I'm taking a little bit of the cobalt blue deep, mixing it with a bit of the cobalt green, and you see, the amount of paint that's on my brush is thinner at the moment because I don't really want thick, lumpy bits. And I'm quite happy for bits of the background to um, show through. So I can use quite a feathery touch here to get quite a subtle... The, ..the sky showing through. So as I just touch onto the canvas, the brush touches onto the uh, weave of the canvas and um, catches only on the, on the top part of the weave, giving me this broken effect. Then the next tree again, rather than um, concentrating on, on the um, shape of the tree, I'm more looking at the shapes of the intersections of blue because they're quite, um, quite distinct. And then there's a very dark little triangle um, that comes in there with, with a quite intense green in it. So um, a bit of blue, but a bit more paint on the brush, a bit more of the cobalt green as well, just to get that quite distinct. Now then, we're going to start coming into the warm bushes um, in a minute, but let's just get that um, flow through the background. Now I can see that actually this, this uh, thick bush should be slightly further over. I didn't pay attention to that when I was blocking it in earlier. Uh, but fortunately, because I, I mixed a, a good amount of paint up, I have the sky colour right here. So all I have to do is take a little bit of sky colour and um, Uh, break up that um, uh, drawing of the more solid tree with a bit more sky coming through it so that my little shapes can be that little bit more accurate. So in other words, if you find it hard to get the, the actual shape of the tree, try painting the negative shape that's around the tree.
and just while I've got the sky colour on the brush, just breaking up a few more little bits of blue through the trees in the background by the church. Slightly brighter blue there. So as I'm, I'm putting in smaller and smaller shapes, so I'm also being a little bit more careful about the, the tone. So the tone relationship is becoming uh, a little more closely knit. And again, put the brush straight into the water. Now, back to my tree colour. And actually, those trees in the background are getting a little bit misty. Um, so I'm using a little bit of the bluey mauve in with this um, cobalt green. Because the mist is quite useful because the blue will help to give that extra um, dimension to the background trees, making them that little bit further away. Okay, now here comes my, my bigger tree, just slightly to the right, to the left of where I first had it. Very slight difference. Now that rather funny hill over there, I might decide to bring in a little bit behind here as a purpley hill, but I'm going to leave that for the moment because that will be a small shape. Um, but just the colour purple there is quite nice. Okay. Now I want to put in the next layer of bushes. The next layer of bushes are that little bit closer and they're going to be that little bit warmer. Just before I, I clean this brush, brush off, I'm just going to redefine the shape um, of that um, hillside field right underneath the big trees that I was hesitant about the shape. So I'm taking a, a bit of cadmium yellow with, um, with the tree colour that I had, a touch of the lemon too. just to redefine that. Now, uh, one thing to remember about the acrylics is that they do dry just that little bit darker than they um, look when you put them on. Now you see the light is just catching on some of the bits of foliage above. So I'll put that in now too. Okay, now I clean that brush off. Let it stand in the water till I can clean them properly in a little while. Okay, now another brush. Um, uh, this is the hog this time for the warmer bushes. So this is cadmium yellow with yellow ochre. A touch of the cobalt uh, green. So I'm starting with the big one at the front. Bigger shapes first. Okay, so that gives the yellow light shape. Now I'm taking the sap green with a bit of uh, cadmium and a bit of ochre to do the more intense um, green in the middle. Now we have um, a kind of hedge that goes along here. So 
So first of all, it's brambles. So while the colour is warmer there, the actual um, tone is similar. So that doesn't really jump out at the moment. That sits in quite well. Now I'm making the tone a bit darker so that it jumps out, describing where the light hits on it and where it's in shade. There's a little um, gateway there with a fence and a, and a farm gate we shall put in shortly. Now we have uh, the uh, triangular bush, very distinct shape there. And then we have the um, other warm trees. So we use a bit of cadmium orange. Um, as again, the olive green would be quite useful. Don't have it there. So I'm using cadmium orange now in with the um, cobalt green, just so it's warm. So as I'm putting in these bushes, I'm looking for the negative space that they make. Negative space is the space between the positive shapes. The positive shapes are the shapes of these bushes in the front. The negative shapes are the um, shapes between. And when you um, draw these little shapes between as interesting shapes, then you'll, you'll find that it, it usually follows that the um, positive shapes Okay. Now, having blocked in those small shapes, then we come to the uh, foreground. Now, over there uh, where the swan is, there's uh, reeds and water lilies. I don't know if you can uh, read that. <laughs> see that from where you are but I'm going to move the patch of water lilies just over a bit because I don't really want them off the page there they, they'd be they'd be rather nice coming around into this area and indeed I don't know if you can see around to my right there there there's another patch of water lilies so the water lilies grow um, in little little clumps. Um, sometimes you get red in with them. Um, as they're decaying away, they, they drop to the bottom and, and uh, I decay in, in, in the bottom of the pond of the, of the river. So they grow in these clumps. So that was ochre with orange. This is cadmium yellow with orange. More of the, um, this is emerald green. Put some more green through that in a minute. Now, we have um, some nice rocks. You see those very nice rocks there. I hope that you can you can see. Oops, you can see them. They're just there. See, that's the advantage of her being here on the site. If I was photographing this view, I'd be completely unaware of the rocks which are just off to the side. But um, by sitting here on the site, they're very much a part of the corner of my vision. So if you look into that uh, pile of rocks, there's beautiful shapes in there. You could take your, your sketchbook and, and pencil and draw them. But I often use these acrylics a bit like um, a, a working sketchbook and just, just make my, my drawing direct onto the canvas. And then in the studio, either work up the acrylic with um, some oils or indeed um, just use it as a study and, and make another picture from it. So as you can see now we're, we're starting to move some nice warmth through um, the, the water lilies and the rocks there. So let's carry it on 
uh, making sure we've got nice intervals between, making nice negative shapes so we get a bit of light through these other areas of rock. As you end up um, putting the light into the bit that's further away, you see how the um, grey gets um, less warm. Um, interestingly enough, the um, uh, posts as they come down to the water here bec become greyer also. Uh, maybe the flooding causes that, I don't know. But the line of posts here are grey. Okay. Now we want a little bit of shingle going up the shore here. Okay. Now shortly we'll want to put little touches of dark through the bushes there, but right now let's um, uh, attend to the water. So the water uh, was blocked in, but now that we're putting more half tones through it, we want uh, through all of the middle area, we want to have half tones through this area too. Also through the sky, but that's easy, en easy enough to do in the studio. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, clean off my, my green um, big bush brush a little bit more. I won't mind having a little bit of green in with the water. Um, and let's make some, some more um, colour for the water. So I'm taking my ultramarine and my cobalt blue deep. I'm taking some, uh, oh I thought that was red, that was burnt sienna. Um, let's get the red. That's uh, crimson, so it becomes purple. And a bit of the, the, the green, cobalt green. And we're going to get a little bit more f of a feeling of the waves. Do you remember these uh, slightly um, thin bits where the paint didn't quite cover it? So I'm being a bit more careful now with slightly thicker paint. And I'm varying the tone between those, those mixes that you saw. So we get just a little more variety in the tone. Again, the olive green would be quite useful in there if you have it because, um, because it's quite a deep, rich, but um, neutral green, warmish, but re relatively neutral. So I'm just varying the tone with slightly thicker paint so that there's more um, variety but keeping to the same plan that I had, so that the waves are still going the same way. So where it's slightly lighter, using a little bit more of the, the green from the uh, bottom of the sky, the cobalt uh, turquoise mixed with the blue. And the fact that it's a little muddy is no harm also because, um, you know, the water here isn't entirely pristine, clean looking always. Now the little bit of green coming in there gives just a, a hint of a reflection. I suspect as the evening draws on that's going to happen because I can feel it lightening up now.
And it gets lighter, you see, as, it, as, as the waves um, ripple towards the shore. So I'm just observing what I see in front of me and um, increasing the tonal range according to what I can see. Now, if the light is here and the light is here, it's going to have to move across the water. Uh, generally, we don't get light in spotlights across the landscape. Generally, it moves in a pattern. So, let me just establish that pattern. A bit more blue, a bit more green. So it's a slightly darker tone. It may seem like this water is taking quite a long time to do, but it is um, a third of the picture. And making these half tones while you're here on the site with the lapping of the waves underneath you is distinctly easier than sitting in the studio in a month or two's time when the experience has faded somewhat into the distance. You see how easily the paint is still blending on the canvas? If it stops being easy to blend at any time, back to the palette and remix. Never be afraid to go back to the palette and remix. right as it comes off the edge of the canvas, right underneath, underneath where the boat is, the, the water gets quite dark because uh, the boat itself casts a bit of shadow onto the, um, onto the water. So on the right hand side um, there's a bit more dark and on the left hand side there's a bit more light. Okay, I will just have a few half tones going back through here and then we can move on to the next thing. So this is a very logical progression. Um, and we have almost completed our first two stages. So the first two stages are to um, select and draw in your composition, and then to block it in each area in its basic tone and color. So usually at this stage now, I'd have everybody um, stand back from the canvas um, and you, you see now whether or not everything is sitting in its right full realm. If it's not, then you would go back to um, fix that. So, we have a few more things to put in, some, a few more small shapes, and then we'll go on to the next stage. So the next stage um, will come in a moment, but I have to decide what I'm doing with that big purple blob there. So let's finish painting in the negative shape of the field. Remember, if, if it doesn't work with your positive shapes, then look for your negative shape. So I'm just cleaning off my uh, brush. Be aware to keep hold of any tissues or anything on the boat because you don't want them blowing off in the, in the breeze. Now, I have a blob there. I have a field there. Okay, so the field has to make sense. Now I'm running out of lemon, that's unfortunate. So I'll have to use the cadmium. So because I'm using the, the warmer yellow, I'm using um, also the colder blue.
blue, which is the turquoise, to try and and kill the warmth of the of the very warm yellow. Or I can stop and get out more lemon yellow, but rather than stopping for you, I, I can just adjust with what I have. Because this isn't the finished picture anyway. This is going to be the uh, the block in, not the finished picture. Now I haven't left quite enough room here for the swell of this field as it goes up. So I'm going to put that in just a little bit more accurately. Now, you can spend more, more time on your drawing in the beginning and not have to make these alterations. Or you can make the alterations as you block in. Um, it's up to you. So now for the field in front, I'm using a little bit more of the cadmium yellow. So it makes it become a little warmer, heads towards you, but not as warm as the one right in the front. So this field bends upwards, running up to this one, and then there's a further field behind. Okay, and right on the top, you see the, um, the heads of the seeding grass, and it, it looks a little bit ochery or a little bit orangey. Uh, because the seed heads are, are blowing in the wind there. And I can just exaggerate that a little bit with a touch of orange or a touch of ochre, which just exaggerates that feeling. and then run your eye right up to the tower. So having corrected that, now I just need to put in um, the, the uh, bushes on top. So I'm using some um, cobalt green. Now I can hear that there's a boat coming in behind me. I know that's going to give a swell. So um, I don't want to be doing a fine drawing as that comes by me. So you, ju you can hear what's happening behind you. So you just uh, make sure that what you're working on um, is one of the uh, broader pieces. Okay. Now, just as they come by, uh, I'm going to put out a couple more um, greens, if I can find them. Or I'll just ask Donovan to bring them out. Donovan, uh, if you can, permanent green light and olive green would be really useful, and lemon yellow. In the box of spare paints underneath the seats there. If you can. And if you can't, well, no worries. Um, we just won't have quite, quite such vibrant colours there. Not really a big problem. Now, the last thing that we want to do before we go on to the next... ...put in a little bit of the structure for the trees. So I'm just taking a bit of blue and uh, brown to make a, make a dark, uh, using a light touch because we still have the swells here. Um, use a bit of the medium. <laughs> and we have lots of swells, but if I at least that'll give an idea of the angle of the trees. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, we've got a pile of brine in there. OK, I think we're ready to go on now to the uh, modelling. So the modelling is the third stage. The modelling is the stage we call chiaroscuro, and it's when we put in the um, light and the dark, giving the feeling of three dimensions in the composition. So I'm just putting in these uh, windows and doors. Uh, there's an unusual amount of windows in this tower, more than I would have expected. Now, the cows have moved off here, but we did have cows in the landscape, which would be quite useful here. We'll make them into shape shortly. So, the modelling stage. We want to make the, the, um, the, the, the whole picture come round both this way and this way. In other words, round from uh, left to right as well as having depth from the front to the back. So the first thing that we need to do is to put some shadow in underneath the, um, um, underneath the um, uh, tr trees and bushes. So this is sap green with um, cadmium yellow. And then the, uh, uh, bush it's <coughs> the bush itself is going to cast a shadow. And then in the actual um, in the actual grass in the front there, we're going to see more um, variation in the grass. So I'm going to put out a little bit more cadmium yellow, as much as I can squeeze from this old tube. And lemon yellow. That's lemon. So we just mark in where the light is catching on the grass. I'm using a number at a 10 hog to do this. And by pressing it in with some vertical strokes, it gives the feeling of the reeds there. I'm not doing it all over, just where, where the light is catching on the grass. As we move further up, into the area that has the um, grassy heads going to seed. I'm taking a little bit of ochre with a light red, that terracotta colour, and I'm doing the same again. But this time I'm uh, using shorter strokes and I'm making sure that the tone of it is uh, closer to the tone of the background so that the contrast is less. So that gives the feeling of the, um, the grass receding back up. And then on this hedge, we get a little bit of light that sits onto the top of the hedge. So I could just press that on, and I get a different mark, and you get the feeling of the light onto the top of the hedge. Now, as it dips down into that area where the, the bush is in the dark, use a bit of your olive green or your um, cobalt green. That's a little bit of sap. We 
going in there. But I, I left my lemon without my top on, so I must put that back on. Now you see the uh, orangey tops continue over this way. So back to um, orange and white with a touch of the light red, the terracotta. Just a little subtle dry brush. And the reason it's subtle, the method by which it's subtle, is that those tones, those values, are very close to the um, tones or the values of the uh, paint that's underneath. So you see how this is building up light on dark, dark on light. Actually, I got a splodge or something I didn't want there, but that's quite useful to pick up a little bit of the stonework. So even though the boat rocked and I, I went to the wrong pile, you see how you can um, uh, make use of that by adjusting the uh, colors of the rocks. with the ochre and blue. So. so just a little stone wall in, in there. OK. Now, as I've, uh, as I've worked that up, do you see how the um, front is starting to look a little bland again? So I need to work up the front again with a smaller shape. So I'm taking a little bit of this blue, which has dried a bit. It's already green on my, um, on my brush, adding a little bit more of the turquoise. And I'm making, do you see, there's a, a sort of reflection starting to, to happen over there around the, the reeds, a sort of still part of the water. So I'm just putting that in. I'm just looking and seeing what there is there. And there's another piece over here, just where the, the water is rippling in a certain way. And it follows along here. Now, again, I take some cold blue, don't have that. So I take the turquoise, cobalt turquoise and white with the cobalt blue and white. And it just cools down that, that, that um, blue for me. And as the water ruffles under the wind and we get little wavelets turning over, it just makes another half tone going across. I know I'm going across the water lilies, but it's the same like when I, when I drew in the picture at the beginning, because I've already seen it, I've already put it in there. It will be easy for me to um, I get it back again. So. So the lesson here is don't be precious about what you've put on to, uh, the canvas uh, to begin with. This is, this is a working sketch. This is a painting from the site. This isn't a finished painting. We're working our way towards our finished painting. There's no need to be precious about it. You just keep improving what you've got. Um, and don't worry about getting to the finish before we arrive there. Now, I'm taking a little bit of this uh, warm um, orange that I had in the sky, and just where we get a few uh, really turned over pieces of water, if the light is warm enough to give that orangey glow in the sky, it'll do the same in the water. And you see the um, orange, for those that um, um, might have studied a little bit about Impressionism, the orange is the complementary to the blue. Um, and so that helps to, to enhance the 
they re reverberate um, both one off the other. Now that we've got the light bouncing off there, we could afford to bounce a little bit more of the same light onto the um, uh, biggest tower again. So what I'm doing is I'm just increasing the intensity of that light by increasing both its warmth with more orange in it, uh, which I'm mixing with some of the color that I, I uh, blocked it in with, and by lightening it by adding more white. So I'm making the tone lighter. So that's dry brush, that's just stroking the, uh, the brush very lightly over the surface, allowing a lot of what's underneath to come through. Now, I'll do that with this tower and, and church with a smaller brush shortly. But in the meantime, let's put in a few um, stones here, which would also catch, on, uh, uh, catch the warmth on them. Now that I've done that with the orange, do you see how it, it needs or it could use a bit more of the blue doing the same? So again, I would use the, um, the cold blue if I had it, the thalo blue, but I don't. So I mix it up with the, um, the, the cold green. It doesn't have quite the piquancy that of the, um, of the thalo blue. Um, but, uh, you know, it would take me time to get it out. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that, trying to find it. But I'm making a mental note for myself that, that I would use thalo blue um, when I finish this with oils. So the idea of finishing it with oils is that with the acrylic, it's a very handy way of getting um, your texture, of getting your sketch when um, you're out in the boat or, or traveling or just carrying stuff in the car. But um, the colors are a little bit um, uh, flat um, in the, or, or, or um, crude in a way, they're not, they're not quite as subtle as uh, the colours of, of the oil. The oil colours are, are richer and the, um, the tones again in the acrylic are, are, are lacking a little bit in the depth that, that an oil painting can, can give you. So I would always finish my acrylics with oils. You don't have to, but that's what I would do for myself because I like to get the best of both worlds. So now I'm just doing the same with the um, darks. So this is the, the cobalt blue with a little bit of purple. Just making more and more subtle tone. Um, then we can go back into the land and again I've got the blue already on my brush from the from the water got a little bit extra burnt sienna on, in with it and I can make a few more tones in the rocks so as I'm doing this all the time I'm looking at where the light falls and where the dark falls now I know it's an overcast day but you still see light and dark running through the landscape, even when it's overcast. 
So um, I'm following that thread of sunshine through the picture. And, um, and it starts to, to move the eye um, through and around. Now, that's the process of chiaroscuro. Let's do a little bit more into the bushes and then we'll um, go on to the, the fourth and final stage. Ten minutes left, so I haven't got much time for doing the fourth and final stage, but we will get there. Just do a little bit into these bushes. You don't have any of those greens, do you, Donovan? No. Okay. So again, uh, you know, that's where you're restricted with, with the um, acrylic colour. which you can be less restricted if you have a wider range of greens, but now you see how I've mixed that. That sap green, orange, cadmium green, and a little bit of cobalt green, which is a complicated mixture to give you, but um, uh, there you are. You can always, you can mix it if you don't have it in a tube. So I'm putting in the uh, dark side of the, um, the bushes. So these are all warm bushes, but they have a, a, a darker side underneath. And you see how that helps to run your eye up to the, um, up to the uh, churches now. Now for the light, I'm using lemon with cadmium and uh, the same brush. touch of orange describing where the light is hitting on the bush This one in the front, the colour wants to be that bit stronger on it, so it really shows up. You remember how the acrylic dries a little darker? Now if you um, use water to thin your acrylics, it will do that even more. It will tend to really sink in, particularly if you work on an on a absorbent surface. A bit of darken underneath there. Now you do this through all of all of your bushes, but I just want to now show you the the um, fourth and final stage. So the third stage is to to bring the light and shade, the chiaroscuro through the picture, so everything becomes um, a. a more three-dimensional. You see how the background goes away more because the foreground comes towards you and the um, picture becomes more round. Um, I didn't put the, the modelling onto this church which, which uh, will make quite a difference to it. So we'll just do that. just getting the light onto the side of the church. There's quite a bit of white coming onto the top there. My, my fingers onto the uh, canvas to steady myself against the swell. Just a little touch of white.
little touch of dark. These ah, glad you asked me, Aileen, about my three dark spots. They're going to be cows in a moment. <laughs> They're cows. <laughs> they ain't got any legs yet. Okay, so there's the um, dark side of the tower. Obviously, you can put some more subtle uh, tone in between by uh, just working that around. So there's your middle tone, which is more purpley. Five minutes. Five minutes, says Donovan. Okay, so put that brush away. Oh, I can't. Have... Now you can see how easy it is to fiddle, to um, to get carried away with some little lighting effect. You do need to um, keep an eye on yourself for that because. The main thing is to get the um, the gist of the picture in. You don't want to get carried away with one spot. Okay. Uh, so the the fourth and final stage is the drawing. Now, I I don't know that this brush will do it, but we'll see. Aileen would like the cows put in, so I'm just using a bit of white here for the for the cows. So yes, they're from memory, but uh, they were there. And uh, you did see them as we as we uh, came here. So you saw the dark shape that I put in. So basically, they're rectangles, and then they have um, um, a head and legs added on to them. Okay, now um, we have a, a, a little bit of a wall continuing up here. We have the dark door of the church. So the fourth and the final stage is to put in your narrative detail, the cows, to um, complete your story, basically, and then to pull the, uh, the, the picture together with line. So you're weaving the line through the, uh, through the canvas. So the first stage is to um, set the scene. The second stage is to fill out that scene. The third stage is to start pulling that together uh, with light. So you're refining it, you're controlling where the eye goes with the light. And the fourth stage is to um, knit the final elements together. Okay, so um, you've got the drawing in the trees. You can draw a little bit into your stones. You can draw some waves. They can be darker waves. There's your darker waves. They can be lighter waves. You can uh, continue your narrative with the uh, water lilies. <laughs> Donovan's counting me down. The way to make your mother panic. Um, your water lilies, let's put in a few water lilies. We can even have a few water lily flowers. Um, 
I have to say I'm not being very precise with my colour at this stage. You get your water lilies coming across here. So you're going to have some yellower water lilies, some bluer water lilies, some pinker water lilies, some light, some dark. And you're going to observe the grouping of them. So that's how you pull the picture together um, in the final stages. You've got your um, uh, posts coming up here for the fence. So lots and lots of things to do. But that, that is how to tell the story of Claude McNoise in a simple canvas. It's 16 inches by 24 inches. I see the blue streak I, I didn't finish um, uh, painting over, but it's really not hard. Just take a clean brush, take your, your orangey colour, and um, it paints over it. Really, really not difficult. Just have to use enough paint. So um, there's four simple stages to get an a interesting painting. Um, the scene is good. For those that are following us regularly, um, we've done a lot of recordings while we're out here on the Shannon. So you just need to let us know if you want to see some more of them and we'll, we'll work it in. Um, I find the whole experience very exciting and I wouldn't be able to do a picture like that from just a photograph. It just, when I come to sit down and do it, I just wouldn't feel inspired. I, I've taken many, many photographs on my um, last trips to the Shannon and um, the only ones I've ever actually turned into paintings are those that I've, even if I only did a sketch in, in, in wax crayons, and I would usually do it on a canvas, but even if I've only done a sketch, I would turn it into a painting. But uh, just from a photograph, I haven't yet done it. I, am, uh, I, I intend to <laughs> sometime. But painting, um, however rough it is from the site, I, I really do recommend you try doing it on the spot. So I hope this has made it easy. Um, let me know if you've got any questions. You can always email me and, and I'll respond.